Hi, I'm Francis Campoy and this is Just a Funk. So welcome to episode number 42 of Just for Funk. Today we're going to be covering a topic that many have been asking about, which is Go modules. I will not be covering Go Dep. Instead, we're going to be talking directly about Go modules. You do not need to know about Dep. We'll mention a little bit as in how to uh, migrate from Dep to Go modules and whether that's something you should be doing now. But I'm going to start with something as basic as explaining what a module is and why do we need them. Does that sound fun? Let's get started. Okay, so the first question is, of course, what is a Go module? And the way I like to answer this is by comparing it to two different concepts that we already know. Uh, so a module is a way of packaging software. That's pretty much what it is, right? And once we know that, we can compare it to other ways of packaging software that we know. We have, as the name implies, package. A package is a way of packaging software. And also we have repositories. What are the difference between those? Well, a, a package cannot be subdivided into uh, working pieces, right? Like you could say that you can divide a package into two different files, but now you still need those two files probably, right? To, to represent the whole package. It's basically an atomic thing. While repository contains many packages, right? And those packages can be moved around independently, et cetera, as long as you update uh, all of the import path, the corresponding import paths. Cool. So what is a Go module? Well, a Go module is not atomic. A Go module can contain many packages inside, and that's actually what normally happens. Uh, so it's kind of like a repository. It is also version. Uh, we use semantic versioning. So it's kind of like a repository, right? A repository has one single version for the whole repository, and then you have all the packages inside. But at the same time, there's a little bit of a difference with a repository. One is it is actually not tied to any uh, Git concept, right? They're, they're different things, uh, even though they serve a similar purpose. And the second most important part, which, you know, it's important, but it's, I'd say, a detail that most people do not care about, is the fact that a repository can contain multiple modules. So a module is kind of like a repository, but a little bit more general. And we also talk about versioning, so I guess that's a good question to ask, which is, what is versioning? Why do we use it? How do we use it? And versioning is simply saying, hey, you know, software changes over time. Deal with that. And uh, it's a way of saying, hey, uh, this version worked for me, right? Rather than saying, this version was the version cut on, I don't know, October 2nd of 2017. Uh, it is actually easier to say, you know, I'm using V2. Right, And uh, we specifically use a, sp a way of managing those versions, which is what we call semantic versioning. Semantic versioning, or SEMVER, is a pretty straightforward uh, convention on how to name versions. You always start with V, right? So that's important. Uh, not everybody does, but in the Go community, you're supposed to start with a V. So the version 1.0, it's actually V1.0.0. That is the basic, the first version of uh, v, uh, version one, that is V1.0.0. Now, what are those two other ones, right? Like we have V1, V2, V3, those are the major versions. And the idea is that you have a major version for every single um, non-backwards compatible version. So say uh, Go. So in Go, we have v, V1.0, V1.1, the three, et cetera, until the 11 now. Uh, next, we'll have the 12, probably. But eventually, maybe we'll have go 2.0, right? And uh, the whole idea is that once you name that go 2.0, what you're implying is not that there's some really cool new stuff, but rather that if you try to use code written for V1, and try to compile it with v2, it might not work, right? So you've broken that backwards compatibility. And that's what the major version means. The second number, uh, so 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, 11 for Go, we have what we call features, right? The idea is that is a minor version, and we increase it when we have not broken any backwards compatibility, but we, ha we have added something new. Uh, that it's, again, backwards compatible. That's the whole point, right? So for instance, say uh, we've added type aliases. 
type aliases doesn't mean that the previous code doesn't work with the new compiler. Uh, it totally works, right? The other way around, if you write some type alias and try to compile it with go1.0, it will not work. But if you get something that was written for go1.0 and compile it with go1.11, it will work. That's why it's a minor version. And minor versions basically are safe to move forward. Um, and I say basically and practically and in theory, because indeed sometimes uh, things happen. You know what word I was thinking, but something sometimes things happen, and it means that that backwards, backwards compatibility has actually not been protected, right? So these things happen. They tend to be a bug because if it was not a bug and we broke that backwards compatibility. Uh, intentionally, we should have changed the major version, not the minor. And the third number is what we call the patch. And a patch is simply that. It's something, it's patching the previous version. We're not adding new features. We're just fixing things that were broken. So whenever you have a, a small issue that has been fixed, you will see that that number increases. Um, you also see this in the Go community in general. When uh, there's issues that are so important that we want to retrofit them into the previous version. Uh, in general, you will see this with security updates, right? Say there's an issue that has been detected in some part of the standard library. We want to change it. We will apply that change to, say, go 1.11.1. We'll go to go 1.11.2. That means something has changed in the, since the previous version, but it's nothing new. Uh, it's not a new feature and it definitely doesn't break anything, right? It just fixes some things and that's what a patch is. There's a different naming convention that I actually almost prefer, which is rather than saying major, minor and patch, which implies some kind of size, uh, it says breaking feature patch. Breaking because when you use that number, when you change the numbers, because you're breaking the backwards compatibility with the previous version. Uh, the second number instead of minor is feature because maybe there's a lot of code that is new, but you didn't break anything previously, right? So you can still use that one and then patch, which is not breaking things, not features, just fixing something that needed to be fixed with a patch. Okay. So enough theory and let's start playing a little bit with modules and see how they work. I'm going to be using Docker for this because that way I will show you how everything is from scratch. There's nothing in there. It's a completely new Docker container every single time I run something. Okay. So uh, you can also do that. It's actually available already. Go 1.11. So you can run Docker run Golang 1.11 and that should work. Let's do that. Okay. So let's get started by running Go 1.11 in a Docker container. So in order to do that, I'm going to do a Docker run. RM so it gets deleted at the end, IT so it's interactive TTY, and then Golang 1.11. And okay, we got it running. And if I do Go version, you'll see that this Go version 1.11.2. So going back to the semantic versioning, it means that this version 1 of Go, which is the first one to be stable and never has been broken. The 11 means that it's the 11th time we release a new version with new features. And dot two is the the third version, so the second time we fix something in the Go 1.11 uh, version. So one dot, Go 1.11.0 was the first one. Apparently there was an issue that is important and we fixed it and now we have 1.11. Then, then we got 1.11.1 .1, and we did that again and now we get Go 1.11.2. That's how these things work. So, okay, so what I'm going to be doing next is going out of GoPath. Uh, go and go path uh, will tell you that that slash go that uh, go path and instead we are under root those are not the same place which means that we're going to be writing go outside of go path <laughs> now this seems like it's a uh, a huge change, uh, but it's actually not that big, other than for the fact that now you have the freedom to write things outside of GoPath. Uh, you also have the freedom to write things inside of GoPath, and I still do that just because everything that I do is around GoPath. I decided that even when I download things like Rust, I actually downloaded Rust by doing go get dash d github.com slash Rust slash Rust, right? So that works. It is probably a weird thing that I do, but it is a thing that you can do. And now you can also write that code completely outside of GoPath. So let's try that. I'm going to create a new file. I'm going to call it uh, my cat, which is not the animal. It's actually the cat, the command. So we're going to go to my cat and uh, now we are going to write some code. So 
let me install vim because I'm sure it's not there since it's a completely new container. Cool, and now this directory is still empty. So when we're gonna do a vim main.go package main func main. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the simplest cat that simply gets the input from standard input and print it to standard output. So that's gonna be IO copy OSTD out, OSTD in. Uh, let's see, and that's going to return an error. And if error is not nil, log fatal error. Import IO OS log. Uh, running Go without Go imports is always fun. Uh, okay, so let's see. Go fun dash w main dot go and go run. Go build. That's going to generate my cat, which is that binary there. Uh, not find my cat. <laughs> uh, I found my cat. Uh, oh, file is not installed. Docker. Okay, so uh, if I do my cat and I do hello, it prints hello. And if I do ls slash my cat, it just just works and prints itself, right? Cool. So uh, this is a Go program, and it's running outside of modules. But if I wanted to add extra things, say I'm going to now depend on set of log, I'm going to use logros, and that is github.com slash syrupson slash logros. Go run main dot go. Uh, yeah, it could not find it. Uh, and if I do go get, it should try to find it and install it. But it's saying, hey, I cannot do this because I, you're outside of GoPath. I cannot store code when you're outside of GoPath. That's not a thing that Go knows, knows how to do. Well, go models to the rescue. We're going to create a Go module here, right? So we're going to go from having a directory that has some Go code into having a directory that has a Go module. You simply do Go mod in it. And when you do that, it will complain. It will complain because you're outside of a Go path and it doesn't know what module you're initializing. Um, it does know that this is the model you're initializing, but what is the import path? The import path? Right. That information used to be in the directory of uh, where you were storing that code inside of GoPath. That information is now gone, so you need to give it again. So go mod in it, let's say github.com slash campoy slash macat. And of course, you can choose any name you want to hear. I'm going with the traditional one just because it's easier to remember, to be honest. Um, okay, so now we have go mod. Let's see what's, what's going on there. Okay, so there's go mod, but this doesn't do anything yet. Uh, but if you do go build, look at that. So now it was actually able to understand that you're inside of a go module because of that go mod file. And it went and downloaded all of the dependencies, uh, even found things that were wrong, like this log is not used anymore, so we need to remove it. But the important thing here is all of that output. So we tried to find github.com slash rips and slash logros, and we saw that we had the v1.0, so we didn't have it on our machine, so we downloaded it from GitHub, so downloading github.com slash syrupson. Then we figured out that we also needed this ghost pew and this testify and this stretcher and this, all of these things. All of those are actually needed not by us directly, but, but by loggers itself. So let's see what we have under go mod. Cool. So now we have required github.com slash ropes and slash loggers v1.2.0. So that is the information that we really care about. It's the fact that our module depends on that module. And this is where you're going to have all of that information. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, there you go. It also created go.sum. And go.sum has way more information. I'm going to put it a little bit smaller so it's easier to read. But you can see here that on top of the version that we're using, we also have a hash. This hash here 
it's a cryptographic hash and the whole point of this is that we know whether something has changed over time right so say that i have v1.0 right and we know this v1.0 because when we visit that website we have under tags we have v.1.0 and that's the last one that's why that's the one we're using right cool simple but what if someone that has commit access to this repository was able to do uh, to change something and then do git push dash f right like now they're pushing a new version into the same tag how do you know that this change well you know that through go some uh, this information will change and it will actually complain and say hey like you're saying that this is the same version but it is not something is wrong right so you're going to be fixing this uh, and actually let's let's build this run it so I'm going to do uh, find my cat. Cool. And then uh, let's see what happens if we say, actually, we don't want to use V1.0. We want to migrate down to V1.1, for instance. How do we do that? Well, it's actually pretty straightforward. You go here and say, we're going to be using 1.1. Thank you very much. And now when you do go build, it's going to say, ooh, actually, we need that version. So we're going to migrate to that one. And also we're going to update all of the dependencies that we had because of that, right? Because of, uh, because of uh, loggers. So now if I do go cat mode, it still says the same that I left before, but go dot sum. Now it's going to have, look at that. It has loggers V1 and loggers V2. And these might seem confusing, right? Because why do you have V2? We're not using it anymore. Well, the whole point is that we actually going to remember when we said V2, V1.2, what version we actually meant to the point that if later on, if we say, oh, you know, actually downgrading to V1 was not a good idea. Uh, V1.1 was not a good idea. We should migrate back to 1.2. Now we're going to be able to say whether this was the previous 1.2 that we're using before. So now when basically when you're doing, uh, when you're reverting, you know, you're reverting to something that you can trust. So go the mod is the way where you indicate what you depend on. Go.sum is how we track what you actually depend on specifically to the point that if anyone changes anything, including just a little typo on a comment or something, and they just do push dash F, you will be able to notice, right? So you have those two pieces. And now the question is, of course, well, do I need to put both of them uh, on my GitHub? And the answer is yes. Uh, I have heard people saying you should not do it because the problem is that if you have two different users that are uh, editing go.sum, you're going to have uh, merge uh, conflicts. Yeah, and that's great, uh, right? Because the whole idea is that if you have two different developers that are using a different version of the same library, that's a problem that could cause errors, that could cause having uh, on one side someone writing some code and testing it versus version one and someone else actually doing over version two and they don't even notice because actually they have the same tag so it is important to commit your uh, go.sum uh, it can cause problems but those problems are actually features that's not a bug when you have an issue with go sum that's actually a good issue to have because it means that you're actually taking care of that concept of having hermetic builds, which means that everything goes inside of the build. Okay, so now we know how to create a new module, go mod in it, and then how to add dependencies. You can simply do go get and that will work. Uh, what if we wanted to upgrade back to the previous version? So something that we could try is to go get this dash u. Actually go get dash u of that, of loggers. And hopefully this will realize that there's a latest version and we'll go back to that previous version. So now go mod, you see V1.2. It also added two more indirect, um, indirect dependencies. Do not worry too much about those. Uh, basically what we're saying is that those dependencies are actually there, not directly, but indirectly. And depending on the platform that you're using might be different. So that, that's why all of these things will appear. Actually, it's a great thing to do to run go mod tidy. And that will even find more things. It will find the, the libraries that you're depending on for your tests. Because when you're doing go get and go build, the test files are ignored. 
what we're doing now is actually paying attention to those two because once you're running a test, you want to make sure that you still have that hermetic build with the same qualities. So when the test works, you know that it's because all of your code works. When it fails, it's because something fails. It's not because there's a new version that you did not expect that was downloaded to the machine, right? So uh, let's see what do we have in GoSum now. Look at that. <laughs> that's now GoSum. That's pretty big. Okay, so now that we have the basics, the next questions are actually all about, hey, so what do I do with these now, right? Like, not everyone is using Go modules. Uh, how do I make it so this will work for everyone? Well, if they're using Go 1.11, that will just work. Uh, if they're using something previous to that, it will probably also work. But for some older versions, this will not work. Unless you vendor the dependencies, right? We can definitely do that. So the dependencies are not here. Where are they stored? Actually, they are stored under your GoPath package mod. And you're going to be able to see all of the things in there. Uh, all of the code that we've downloaded is there for easy access. If you wanted, you could even have something like this, but remote uh, internally at your company or whatever, but in a different server. And if you're interested in that, you should definitely check out uh, Athena which is a way to manage modules. It's a pretty cool project, so you should definitely check it out. I have a link to one talk that uh, Aaron Schlesinger uh, gave at Gopher Palooza recently about it, so if you want to check it out, it's to be here or there. I still never know. Um, okay, so uh, what else can we do with this? So go mod vendor. Now when I do go mod vendor, look at that, that was super fast. But now we have a vendor file. And that vendor contains all of the source code you depend on, right? So now we're back to the previous, like if you're doing Go 1.6, uh, it will definitely not work with modules. But thanks to these, you can start using modules and make sure that people that are trying to use your code can use it no matter what version they're using. So one more thing you might want to consider is using Go Mod Y. And Go Mod Y, it allows you to answer a very useful question, which is, hey, how do, why do I use this, right? Like that's a why. Why do I even have this in my, in my go.sum? So let's see, go.sum, we have a lot of dependencies. Uh, how are you using this one, go deflet? Uh, I do not know personally, but uh, if I do go mod Y of that, it will tell me that it doesn't know either. And that is normal because actually we're not using github.com slash pmezart slash go devlib, but you're using something else, a module that is inside of there. So uh, let's add dash M to say, actually find something that is in there that answers the question. And now we found it. Uh, we're actually using go devlib slash devlib, which is used by the testify assert, which is low, used by the testing package inside of Logros, which is obviously used by Logros, which is used by my cat. So we got it. Now that's why we are depending on that library. Cool. So I showed you how to create something from scratch, but what if you really have some code and you want to migrate to use Go modules? So uh, in order to do that, I'm actually going to use a piece of code that I already wrote a long time ago. It's called embeddmd. So I'm going to do git clone https github.com scan boy embeddmd. And this is useful to embed source code inside of Markdown. Uh, I use it all the time for my workshops. Okay, so if we go there, you will see that uh, this does not use go mod, go sum, or dev, or anything like that. There's nothing in here. I'm not taking care of the dependencies. So uh, what next? Go mod in it. And now I was able to actually figure out that this github.com slash campo slash embed and D. How did it figure that out? I'm assuming it's because of the git remote, uh, get URL origin. I think that this is where it's getting information from, but maybe not. So uh, it's it's an interesting thing to check out if you feel like checking that out. But anyway, now we have cat go.mod and we have that information. Now, this is a module. It is not complete because we, had, we don't have any dependencies. How do we find those? Go get dot, dot, dot. Just install everything, right? And look at that. The first one is go devlib. Uh, we're using devlib. Uh, we will not be able to find it here. Oh, we found it. So, oh yeah, because we're already using it from before, right? Go mod. It just says we're using go devlib. Uh, here we're using it directly, though, apparently. Uh, about go sum. Cool. Uh, so go devlib. Perfect. What if we do go mod tidy? 
Okay, go down mod. Cool, so this works, and now we have something that works. Easy, right? Uh, now this is a module. And we have our god.mod, go.sum. And if you want to have the dependence vendors, uh, the dependencies vendor or the vendor dependencies, you can do go, vote, go mod vendor. And fine vendor will tell you that we also we only have this diffleaf.go. Okay, so now that we've seen how to create uh, from scratch and also from code that already existed, but uh, it didn't have any dependency management yet. Now we're gonna do one that has dependency management already there, which is uh, we're gonna be using our uh, one of my repositories, the Go Tooling Workshop, and we're going to migrate from dep to modules. So git clone github.com slash campoy slash go tooling workshop which is by the way a great workshop and you should check it out and if you work for a conference and you're interested in me running it let me know uh okay so go tooling workshop and now uh so we have go package.log go package.taml and we have vendor right so we already have all of that information what happens if i do go mod in it well we copy the requirements from the go package.log uh, so now we have a go.mod. If I do go mod tidy, actually, let's see what we have in there for now. We have some information. We have the dependencies. By doing go mod tidy, we find not only the ones we really depend on, but also the ones we depend through tests. So go.mod. So we have a little bit more, but also go.sum. It's going to be also all of that information that we have. And now that we have this, there's something we can do, which is remove go package.toml, go package.log, and even vendor uh, rf. And now we can do go get dot dot dot, and let's see if this works. Cool, and go test dot dot dot, and see that all of these just still works, which is great, right? Like we migrated from uh, from not having modules to modules super fast, and if we still want to give support to other versions that do not know about modules, we can still do go mod vendor, and see that we have under vendor we have all the, the dependencies that we have, so they're all there, which is great. But now I wanted to do one more thing that it's gonna show a thing that is a ah, little bit of a pain. Uh, we're gonna remove uh, go.mod, go.sum. So now we don't have neither dep, nor modules, nor the vendor directory. Actually, <clears throat> let me remove that vendor. So we have no dep, no modules, no vendor, nothing. And I'm gonna do go mod in it. And this created the, the repository, which is cool. The go mod, I uh, created the mod file, which is perfect. And now I'm going to do go get dot dot dot. And it doesn't work. Uh, what is going on? Well, this is actually kind of interesting, right? Because it's saying, hey, uh, so you're saying github.com syrups him with a la capital S. And but actually, the one I found was github.com syrups and with a lowercase s logros and if you look at the code you will see that there's a go mod in that go mod here it says github.com syrups and, syrups and logros and that is exactly the way you should be importing it if you try to import it in a different way it will not work which explains why all of a sudden it complains about uppercase versus lowercase which is a new problem but uh, it is important to take it into account how do we fix it well let's see Go mod is empty. So where are we using Syrupson? Well, actually the, the easiest way to do this is to say, we're gonna find everything that is dot go and then grab for Syrupson. Cool, we got it. So this is our file and that, uh, Syrupson, lowercase, we change that, we do go get dot dot dot, 
and now it works and if we do after we're done building it we do go mod tidy it added a little extra thing and cat dog on mod looks perfect it's saying hey you depend on logros which is exactly what we're doing and if we do go.sum we'll have all of the information about the exact version that we're using and we can do again go mod vendor and put those available inside of a vendor directory right there cool so this was a quick intro to modules i hope you, that you got the main things it's a way of packaging uh, packaging your code with all the dependencies so then it easy, it's easier to share. You're going to be able to manage dependencies. You can migrate from nothing or from depth and everything you need to do is go mod in it. And there's some little quirks that you might take in, you might need to take into account. If you want to know more about Go modules, I definitely invite you to ask me as many questions as you want. You can find me on Twitter as Francesc. You can also send suggestions to form.justforfunk.com. And also for sure, you can leave comments down here. What is the next thing you want to know about Go modules? Have you used it? Are you happy with them? Do you have some issues? Tell me more. I'm very, very curious about this. Go 1.12, which will be released sometime in February, if I'm not mistaken, will actually contain the final-ish version of Go module. So now is the moment to give all of your feedback. As always, please like, subscribe, all of those things. Tell all of your friends how awesome Just for Funk is. And if you've already done that, then I guess it just... Thanks for watching and see you all in two weeks.